Hello and welcome to the Fundamental Value Podcast, hosted by Joshua Frank, co-founder and CEO of The Thai. On Fundamental Value, we speak with leading analysts, traditional finance and digital asset firms, and investigate how leading minds in the cryptocurrency space, research, analyze, and quantify the value of digital assets. Quick disclaimer, this podcast was recorded and is being made available solely for informational purposes. Today, I am very, very excited to be joined by the one and only Jonah Van Borg, who is the global head of trading at Cumberland. Jonah, it's great to have you on. Josh, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, you having me on your podcast. I'm I'm honored. Jonah and I had a a great time at Crypto Bahamas earlier this year and uh, excited to hopefully hopefully rehash rehash again. And I I know from our conversations that there's going to be a lot of great tidbits here. So why don't we why don't we roll right into it? So. So Jonah, you obviously you know have have a, have a lot of experience outside of crypto, uh, you know, and, and you're you're relatively newer to this space. And so, can you kind of give give a, a little background on on what you did before you fa- fell down this rabbit hole? Oh yeah, I mean, listen, meeting you at Crypto Bahamas that was my first crypto conference, and it's weird being the oldest person there by ten years, a um, bunch <laughs> of twenty two year olds schooling me about how crypto works. So basically, yeah, I guess I started at Lehman Brothers right out of college, just as a trader. Um, kind of a typical thing to do back then if you have a math and stats background. Lehman obviously exploded spectacularly. It was the world's, I guess, America's largest bankruptcy about a year later. Um, And then I just kind of floated around and landed at Goldman Sachs, where I traded crude oil for about five years. Um, Traded, it's just an OTC market maker. Back then it was pretty manual, like You know, people calling up two phones, screaming prices across the trading floor, like kind of old school trading before before trading had kind of transitioned from where it was then to where it is now, which is from human time then to kind of machine time now. Um, So right around the time that it was going to machine time and our jobs were sort of getting automated, I switched over to VTOL, which is the world's largest oil trading company. And when I was there, I traded, you know, let's call it primarily derivatives, options and futures. Um, But I also managed to get involved in the physical oil as well, which is pretty interesting to see an actual physical commodities market and touch it and move these giant skyscraper sized cargoes around the world. That's, that's pretty cool and crazy. Um, and then after about seven and a half, seven years of that, um, crypto came knocking and I, I was ready for it. I guess <clears throat> the way that I ended well, before, up in crypto, before we even get into that, you must have still been there the day oil went negative. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, that was bananas. I mean, <laughs> I, I was there in you know air quotes because I was basically sitting at home and it was during COVID and just looking at my screen thinking like, is my connection fucked up? Is this real? Like it, it was crazy. But ultimately what it tells you is that if there's a physical asset and there's nowhere to put it, you have to, you know, you have to pay somebody to take it out of wherever it is and remove it for you kind of like unwanted furniture. And, uh, you know, I think what you end up with in, in kind of, market environments like that. It's a bit misleading. You know, it gets a lot of press when the price of oil goes negative. Oh my God, what does this mean for the world? Let's face it. Most crude oil in the world was significantly positive and had plenty of value in it at that time. It was really just the prompt WTI, West Texas Intermediate Contract, a couple of days before expiry when almost everybody's forced to get out except the physical players like VTOL. Um, only that very niche, bespoke, illiquid prompt thing went negative because there just wasn't enough tank space in a, in a place called Cushing, Oklahoma, you know, very, very nerdy commodity fundamental stuff. Um, but it got, it got all the headlines. That was, so that did was, you rent a, did, you, did you rent a U-Haul yourself and go out there and pick up a couple barrels? <laughs> I didn't, but my company, uh, my company did. And that, let's just say that was a, an interesting p event. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so talk about so so can you talk a little bit about kind of moving from oil into crypto why you decided to to join Cumberland and and then you know we'll talk a little bit more about the firm after. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I've always been fascinated with crypto ever since I first learned about it, you know, one of my buddies read about it on Wired, um, you know, taught us about it. Uh, he was one of the early employees at Ripple. Um, back in 2013, they offered me a hundred million XRP to quit my job at Goldman and be a market maker on their network. 
And I turned that down because it just didn't make any sense to me at the time. Now, obviously, <laughs> looking back at what the price of Ripple did from when it was worth, you know, a basis. It went up to a couple Ripple. dollars, didn't it? So you would have it had went a, up to that must... three dollars and I think twenty five cents. This and was, I, this was I December know this pretty intimately. Yeah, because I felt that viscerally when I went back and read reread that you know offer email that I turned down. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was sort of the first crypto miss I had, first of many. And then, you know, just after watching it for a while and trading commodities and watching it and just kind of keeping it on my radar as part of the macro you know picture that you have to focus on as an oil trader, you have to understand what's going on in the world. You know, after a while, this light bulb went off, and it it was just sort of obvious that like, hey these things are commodities, you know, like you, you kind of like, like Ethereum, for example, you, you either buy it or you mine it for now. Um, then you spend it as gas, you kind of refine it. And then after doing so you unlock valuable, you know, sort of goods and services like NFTs or DeFi. And I just thought, Oh my God, that's the same as this thing that comes out of the ground called oil, which in and of itself in its raw form, isn't particularly that useful, but you know, then you just stick it in a refinery, alter it a little bit, and suddenly you can put in a jet and fly around the world. So basically, once it once I had that sort of um, light bulb moment, like, hey, this this is a digital commodity. I get this, and the market, you know, volume started to pick up, and it didn't like the odds of it being vaporware just kind of went down significantly. Um, <clears throat> which you know, you never know when a new technology comes out whether it's going to work or not. But you know, a little bit, little bit of market maturation and understanding, and finally, I was just you know. When there was an opportunity at Cumberland to to take this position, I, I just I kind of jumped. It's 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 also very exciting to challenge yourself intellectually. And I've I've traded four different markets now. It's um, once you trade something, um, once and then you switch to another thing, like changing asset classes becomes a whole lot less whole yeah, just less scary in general. Yeah, I mean, and, that was uh, actually one of my, my later questions, which is like, how does the market structure in crypto differ from the other markets that you've traded in the past? Um. So it's a great question. And I would say that most of it looks pretty darn familiar. Let's put it that way. Like even physical markets, I, you know, the market structure of what it takes to get a barrel of oil from a place where there's too much like Nigeria to a place where there's not enough like China, you know, that's <clears throat> doing that isn't actually all that different from getting Bitcoin around the world. Some of the nodes in the transactions have different names and the last mile of crypto and frankly, the last mile of crude oil, too. They're both pretty weird and bespoke and you know, very different from each other. But most of the market structure and most of the way these markets are maturing is fairly similar, I would say. So I actually want to dive into that a lot later. I have a bunch of questions, but let's go back really quickly and, and dive into to DRW more broadly in Cumberland. So can you, you know, what is DR? I mean, a lot of people know what DRW is is but you know it'd be great for for those that don't to kind of give background but what does cumberland specifically do how is it related to drw and what does it do in crypto sure um drw is a proprietary trading company founded by don wilson um i want to say slightly over 30 years ago um it originated in the sort of the chicago trading pits and then just sort of grew up into uh you know the world of modern proprietary trading you know technology driven you know, pretty, pretty uh, technology intense type stuff. And Cumberland is a wholly owned subsidiary of DRW. Um, so while it's a separate entity, um, you know, we have TradFi backing behind us, which makes us, uh, you know, an appealing counterparty to people who, you know, may have seen some of the things that occurred in the crypto market over the last three months and are, you know, they want to trade with people that they trust and that have been around for a while. And so Cumberland was founded in 2014, you know, it's one of the oldest companies in crypto, um, venerable eight-year-old institution, um, and backed by a, uh, you know. It's like the bony crypto. melon of crypto, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> exactly. Been around since the uh, good old days of 2014. Yeah. And, and so what are the different products and services? You know, you mentioned that it's a counterparty, right? So there's, there's an OTC desk, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and one of the largest by volume. But, but what are the other... What are the other products and services or things that that you know clients can access working with Cumberland? We're we're a liquidity provider. Um, basically, it's not just about OTC, even though that is something that we do. There's, you know, there are many ways that people can connect with Cumberland. If, if um, Grandma goes to buy Bitcoin on, you know, some exchange, FTX.us, right? Um, 
perhaps we're on the other side of grandma's trade. It's, it's a liquidity provision isn't just about, you know, direct over the counter transactions, especially as markets mature. It's about making sure that you have the technology and, you know, sort of the quantitative chops to be able to stream prices to everybody all the time, wherever there's volume. So as a, as a liquidity provider, you try to enhance the amount of volume in the, in the market where there is volume, you try to get involved and tighten spreads. And on, you know, our mission is to get more people into crypto. And the way that we're going to do that is by making the market as accessible, transparent, liquid, and, you know, sort of accessible as we can. So in addition to liquidity provision, there's, you know, obviously you, you can't be a liquidity provider without taking a lot of risk. And, you know, one point I do want to make is like, what, what does it mean to be a liquidity provider? You have to offer value to your counterparty. They're not just trading with you out of some, you know, charitable sort of desire to, to pay you, right? They, you need to offer them value. And back in the day when I was at Goldman, the value that we would offer was we have access to liquidity venues that you don't. So trade with us and then we'll get out of the risk in a place where you can't, right? And that's, that was easy stuff. That was, an, you know, that was a layup. Obviously, that's not the case in crypto. Everybody has access to everything. And so what value can you offer your counterparty? Well, you you basically either have to take risk or you have to have a sense of where the market is going to be. And so rather than arbing, um, you know, counterparties versus a tighter liquidity venue that they can't access, like what we did at Goldman 10 years ago, you have to you have to sort of trade between your counterparty's desires and liquidity needs now and what's going to happen in the market three seconds in the future. And that involves a ton of math and a lot of effort. And that's sort of the value that, you know, a lot of risk too. So that's sort of what we do. And so what are the challenges uh, around liquidity in crypto? Obviously, you know, in this space, we have like 4 million exchanges. Uh, obviously, there are a few of those exchanges, which are a lot more liquid than the vast majority. But how does that fragmentation impact the market? And is there any geographic fragmentation that, that, that impacts you guys or makes it more difficult to trade? Oh, entity structure is an endless conversation if you're running a crypto liquidity provision business. I mean, you, you, you can't just set up shop somewhere and connect everything and expect that to be the right answer. You have to really think through the legal and regulatory aspects and you know, the lattice of crypto exchanges around the world is pretty remarkable. Not all of these exchanges need to exist, but many do because they you know, operate in local jurisdictions. And as far as the bigger ones are concerned, you know, you talk about the comparisons between crypto and TradFi, you know, over time, you don't need this many exchanges and every market goes the same direction, including crypto, right? You look at the crude oil market, there's two big exchanges, the NYMEX and the ICE. <clears throat> They're a duopoly. Even the most well-capitalized, brilliant upstart competitors, uh, they just fail. Like entrenched monopoly or duopoly structures sort of exist in many TradFi markets. And crypto is definitely heading that direction. It'll have more because of local jurisdictions and regulations and rules. But <clears throat> in order for us to connect all these different exchanges and, uh, you know, liquidity venues, both on and off chain, you know, that and, and sort of connecting the dots between all of them. That's, you know, that's a multivariate uh, equation for us that, that we have to solve every day. And <laughs> the landscape keeps changing. So we have to keep resolving it. It's not easy. And that's, that's just, you know, frankly, in terms of offering value to your counterparty, the fact that we're solving that equation ultimately ends up delivering value to the people who trade with us. And so you actually mentioned something interesting, which is on and off chain trading. And so you also talked about risk. So how do you think about risk management on chain and off chain? Because there are, you know, significantly more risks associated with trading on chain. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and so how do you kind of think about risk and the different types of risk in this space? And, and how do you go about managing those risks? It's, it's a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. So there's, you know, when you're a trader, it's your job to think through the different types of risk. And you can't just say, oh, I have, you know, downside doing this. You have to be pretty specific about how you parcel out the risks. So, you know, there's price risk, there's counterparty risk, there's credit risk, there's, I guess in crypto, there's a new one called rug risk, where the thing you're trading on just <laughs> friggin' isn't there one day. Um, 
Um, that's a, that's a new one for me. Um, I guess not new. Lehman Brothers got pretty rugged. <laughs> that, that was unexpected. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, things just disappear, right? And you have to, you have to be focused on those and many other types of risks that we don't want to, you know, bore your listeners with, but ultimately, um, managing risk is critical on chain in particular, because, you know, the beauty of DeFi and DeFi is definitely fulfilling its promise, even through this bear cycle, like it behaves as it's supposed to, it has rules, it applies them mathematically to the capital that's locked inside of these ecosystems. And like, it works, right? And so well, as long yeah. as the math works, and somebody can exploit it for all the tokens to <laughs> yeah, hacking risk, another one, <laughs> um, it just runs off with your with your dough in a way that you didn't expect. So yeah, I mean, there's no FDIC insurance. There's no digital Janet Yellen coming in to bail out the entire system. There's no, you know, digital OPEC cutting supply when when prices go down to pump them back up, right? It's just like d- on-chain liquidity behaves according to the code that, it, that you know, is underlying it. And if you read the white paper and you understand where the yields are coming from and you think before you act um, and you ask these questions, you know, risk management, you know, is fairly straightforward. If you ignore that stuff and expect, you know, you, you, you operate under the assumption that the laws of economics don't apply to on-chain trading, you know, I, th- I think you're in for a shocker because they do, right? Crypto is not this, this land of, of rainbows and rivers of chocolate where, you know, supply and demand don't exist. Like, you know, if, if there's a system that's, that has a flaw, like the flaw will eventually take down the system. And if the system is well-designed and simple and straightforward, it'll behave as you expect. So that's, that's sort of how we think about on-chain risk management. Off-chain risk management is a, you know, a different story. And so speaking to liquidity of markets in a little bit more depth, you know, how do you think about like, how liquid are on-chain versus off-chain markets? Like what what size, you know, can do you feel like, you know, like where do you start to see massive slippage on Bitcoin? Like if somebody went in and placed X number trade on Bitcoin, where is it going to slip by a percent or a 2%? Like what what is that kind of threshold? Oh, it depends how they execute. Like if somebody just decides to blast- Like logs on to Coinbase.com and just not even Coinbase Pro is just like, I'm going to eat two and a half percent to- make this trade or, or, you know, like, like, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. So the answer to your question is it's a great question. The answer is not straightforward. So yeah, the example is the day, the time and so many different factors. Right. So, yeah. And it depends on the liquidity environment. It also, it's like the trade, the example you just mentioned is impossible. Like Coinbase limits you at, I don't know, like 35 grand or hundred grand or something. So you can't, okay. Okay. You literally can't, but like, Let's say that somebody went onto exchange number 91 by volume and submitted a oh, market God. order to buy 50 Bitcoin, right? You might move the price of Bitcoin on that exchange by 2%. Meanwhile, if you go on Binance and try to lift the perpetual future up 2.5%, like, I mean, I think you're talking about something over a billion dollars worth of notional. And you would have to do it in the sloppiest possible. Like, you would have to literally be trying to cost yourself money to do that. It's. <clears throat> anyway, what about, um, what about on on chain liquidity though? Because yeah, obviously, so- some of these, you know, I, I I think the the other day when one of these hacks happened, somebody had decided to use this random wrapped Bitcoin wrapped ETH pool, and they just totally like the the pool did like you know I think it's like ninety k in daily volume, and they put like nine million bucks through it or something like that. That's an whatever example, the numbers were. like yeah. DeFi behaving exactly the way that you would expect, right? And, you know, the XYK equation that underlies an automated market maker or many automated market makers, like it's arithmetic, right? Like you literally work out how much the price is going to move if you, if you submit that much volume into a pool that's so undersized. So basically, the way we think about liquidity, and we have to think deeply about it in order to, you know, both survive and thrive as a liquidity provider in a trading house, you know, <clears throat> like you have to ask yourself a bunch of questions before you trade. So let's say that you want to trade a stable coin. A curve pool might be the, literally the best place in the world to do that. It's the, remarkably liquid um, and the product is in, insanely brilliant and good for what it, it's trying to do, which is provide liquidity on stable coins. Um, but um you know, an AMM can also be amazing for token number 537 by, you know, by volume. But for Bitcoin and ETH, you know, like you're probably better off off chain. 
right? And you're probably, you know, if you if you want to, if, if you don't care what you're trading, as long as it's Bitcoin denominated, if you just want to buy a certain amount of BTC, you don't care whether it's a perp or a calendar future or a CME future or spot, and you want to route that order intelligently to, you know, the top 10 centralized liquidity venues across all the different Bitcoin denominated products on those exchanges. If you do that now, if you do that 10 seconds from now, if you do that a day or a week from now, the amount that gets spread across all those different products is going to be very different in each case. So that's a constantly evolving equation. And and how, I guess, you know, how do you think of your role in this space when there's really no prime broker, right? Because traditionally a prime broker will have a ton of assets on each individual exchange and can trade on the user's behalf. But one of the challenges that exists today is none of the prime brokers in crypto are really that well capitalized. And so does that put you in a different spot than you would, would otherwise be in? Or does it does it have any impact? Um, it doesn't impact us because we, you know, we I mean, is, does it create more opportunities for you because clients don't have the capital to trade on all those individual exchanges when, when they need to? It's definitely the fact that there isn't a prime broker in the space that is good, frankly. Um, you know, it probably means we get more flow than if there were 20 prime brokers that are that are amazing. Right. But the problem with the prime broker in crypto is that, you know, not your keys, not your crypto, right? And and the, so what happens if you just go and park a lot of your assets at some crypto prime broker, then you're talking about, and we chat about this earlier, rug risk, right? And, you know, <laughs> two months ago, the, the entire centralized lending industry in crypto, you know, pick your, pick your flowery word to describe what happened. Um, if you're dealing with the prime broker, this, you, you face the same risk. So institutions when they get into the space they want to talk to you know trading houses like cumberland that are well capitalized trad five backed and route their orders to you know the place places that you know cumulatively minimize their impact on the market and i don't i think prime brokerage we, we talked about the last mile of certain markets like i don't think the prime broker model works for crypto um unless you're willing to say <clears throat> I don't care if somebody else is holding, like it's a bearer asset. If, if you don't care if somebody else is hanging onto your bearer asset for you, then, you know, maybe a prime broker makes sense. If not, you know, perhaps, perhaps you should try to either trade directly with exchanges and wind up getting backed into that li liquidity that Cumberland provides. Um, or you, you trade direct with Cumberland. Either way, you know, you're, you're getting the same service and as markets become more efficient, like the prime broker doesn't really offer any value uh, because, you know, eventually as this market matures, if counterparty X trades on exchange Y, even if they're trading direct with exchange Y or market maker Z, all of the dots are going to get connected so quickly on the back end of that transaction, um, like low latency millisecond or microsecond arbitrages are going to occur that minimize that ripple that trade across the entire market regardless of uh, where they place it specifically in the market. And that's that's what we want. That's what a good, efficient market looks like. And that's why vol it's already happening. And that's why volumes have exploded. This is not like any other crypto winter. This is like, you know. So that's actually, it leads into my next question perfectly, which is how has, how have volumes changed over the last quarter, you know, amidst kind of the broader drawdown in, in digital asset markets? Yeah, it's a great question. So Basically, as a trader, you know, whether you're trading prop like I did at VTOL or OTC market making um, like I did at Goldman <clears throat> or both like Cumberland, um, you know, a big signal is when volumes drop off a cliff, right? When, when, you know, when volumes just evaporate and you go into like vapor lock mode in a market, that tells you that the sellers are not incentivized to sell to the buyers and the buyers are not incentivized to buy from the sellers at this particular price set. And so when volumes disappear, that almost always precedes a very large price move. So that happened, you know, then suddenly we just gapped lower and then volumes picked up again. And you would expect, you know, if if the critics are true, if Nouriel Rubini and his army of no coin haters is, is correct, right? Like, and crypto is just, uh, you know, not fulfilling its promise, um, you would expect no one to care, but $20 billion a day worth of spot trades on, you know, the top exchanges. And then 
you have another 60, 80, 60 to eighty billion dollars a day worth of perpetual futures. Like that's bigger what than was the, what was the peak? What were we hitting at the peak? So for twenty billion spot now, what was the peak volume? You know, I don't have that committed to memory, but I would guess it was probably May of two thousand twenty-one, um, yeah. and I would guess uh, a multiple of that. I just don't right. don't know exactly. It's a good question, though. <clears throat> and what about so you talked a little bit earlier about all this this the CFI lending and you know the collapse of a lot of these more centralized institutions and the mistakes that they made what impact does that have on crypto markets in terms of people's willingness to lend uh people's willingness to borrow how does it actually impact the market itself it's a, you know i think that it and does it eventually just correct back to where it was before? Like, it, it definitely damaged trust in the industry. It was, you know, not not good. It's one of the big risks to crypto is just more of these blowups keep happening because people are sloppy about risk management. But you would think that after this big rinse, where the people who, you know, were um, lending lending capital to questionable borrowers and you know taking the, you know, taking the sort of returns from their stable businesses and investing them in unstable things, like, you would think that most of that has been flushed out. So trust should be restored. But I think, I think what it meant was, it certainly made the cost of doing business higher, it damaged everybody's liquidity. And it was just one of those hiccups that happens in the, you know, teeth of a bear market that that sort of creates a, a combination of max pain and max fear. And that's why you saw ETH trade down to, you know, eight or nine hundred dollars a token. Is and any of this surprise? I mean, given your background in tr more traditional and other markets, is any of this surprising to you or feel different or? Yeah, no, this is and that's I'm so glad you asked because this is like the headline here. This is not different from any other bear market. Obviously, you know, this is a new thing. Um, it's crypto is is different and, you know, it's in, Early stage technology has never really been quite this liquid and tradable. So watching these price movements evolve throughout time is definitely fascinating and has captured the attention of the entire world. But like this, the price action, the only thing that's different about crypto from uh, a typical TradFi bear market is that no like gigantic government or cartel style body has, you know, just jumped in to manipulate the market and try to like bail it out, which, you know, I, I would argue is good. I would argue that markets behaving <clears throat> like Adam Smith said they're supposed to is, is what, what you want. You don't want the government to, to come in and just, just print infinite dollars and inflate people's savings into oblivion as a response to some, you know, every single crisis, right? Like you, it's scarier to have volatility, and but volatility creates opportunity, and it also flushes out the good while pre, sorry flushes out the bad while preserving the good. And I think that's it's really it's a it's a feature, not a bug of crypto. And so you know a lot is going on from a macro perspective. Um, you know, are you surprised by how crypto is that 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 crypto is the way crypto is moving in light of everything that's happening from a macro point of view? I mean, obviously. There was all this conversation about Bitcoin as a risk off asset. It's certainly not behaving like one. Um, is any of that surprising to you? And, and how do you think macro impacts crypto moving forward? Yeah, so macro and crypto are very interrelated. But I think often this, this is what happens when you have participants that haven't traded other markets before. They lament the fact that, oh, crypto, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to be an inflation hedge and it's not. It's just levered nasdaq futures this is this is bullshit right you hear people complaining about this stuff but what people you know what those people don't understand is that crypto like every other macro asset including crude oil goes through regimes right so like call up any veteran oil trader and ask them what years uh crude oil just traded tick for tick with the s p 500 and they will list them off to you with a, a sad frown on their face because they didn't have you know, they didn't have the ability to exploit their edge and their fundamental knowledge of crude oil that year because it was just just a, basically a, a shitty S&P derivative. Meanwhile, other years like, you know, 2011 during the Arab Spring, crude was going bananas and the rest of the markets were not correlated at all. And crypto correlation to macro markets is one thing that we pay very close attention to when we trade crypto here because 
you want to know what regime you're in. And this this regime we're in now, where we're trading kind of like a you know tick for tick with the Nasdaq, is not <clears throat> it's not permanent, right? It's it's a it's a temporary regime. And so, and how long do regimes last? Long run, what I would say, uh, just to wrap this thought up, is basically crypto is a debasement hedge. It's not going to protect you from a few hot inflation prints. But it will protect you from the government just printing cash. And over time, inflation is a form of debasement if it lasts long enough. And, and if the user experience of the dollar continues to deteriorate, you know, a few basis points or maybe 10 or 20 basis points of global trade will probably be denominated in Bitcoin. And that, that's the scenario that Bitcoin sort of hedges you for as a macro trader. Do you so, you know, I, I, I you know, do you think like. How long do you think regimes last? You know, you spoke about regimes and, and are they going to last a shorter amount of time in crypto? Like, is this market just moving fast than anything you've seen before? Is it like the same thing, but faster? Or is it the same thing at the same speed? It's it's the same thing, but way, way faster. So you have your crypto cycles, and then you have your macro cycles, and then you sort of have to ask yourself where you are in the relationship between the two. So I think we're in the eighth or the ninth inning of the crypto liquidations. Like, I think that's pretty much finished. Macro, I think, um, you know, I think we're the lows are probably in and we're probably bouncing from here. Um, so I think the the outlook is pretty sunny for crypto and it's, it's a great time to be a crypto bull. But in terms of the crypto specific fundamental cycles, this is open source technology. Like when Apple wanted to build a mapping product, they couldn't just copy Google's source code and make Apple Maps out of Google Maps with a couple updated features. Meanwhile, in crypto with blockchains, that's literally what happens. And so you know, new technology gets iterated at a speed no one has ever seen in the history of the world. And because there are liquid, visible, tradable tokens attached to this technology, the cycles are just insane, like massive amplitude, super high frequency cycles. And, uh, you know, that's pretty bewildering for me as a, as a TradFi native to come into crypto. It's just, whoa, oh my God. It, like ETH has, trades down 70%, up 70%, down 80%, up 50% on the back of macro and a few fundamental things, it's, you know, something to get used to for sure. But I, I don't think that's permanent. I think eventually cycles will slow down as the market matures like every other market does. So when, when you, you spoke about speed and you talked about the ability to fork assets, right, taking an open source project and fork it, but how, how do you, this is a very different question from anything that we've asked before, but how do you build a moat when you can just fork something? How do you build a defensible business if this stuff is all open source and you can just take it and copy it and change it a little bit? Well, okay, so I think the fact like composability is amazing because at some point you're you're going to have people building things that get used, right? And the users of these protocols won't have reasons to use another protocol. They just build on top of things and then you'll have basically what happens in technology, it's called a stack. You'll literally have the bottom layer of the stack and then things just get built on top of it. And the moat is that the closer you are to the bottom of that stack, the harder it is to, you know, harder it is for people who want to build on the very top of the stack to like remove that, you know, layer number two of 15 from the stack. And, you know, ultimately, I think that's how to think about moats in crypto. And so do you think so do you think it's so the platforms themselves are going to be the moats, like your Ethereum and your other layer ones, and the applications are going to struggle and have a harder time to, to build those same moats. I wouldn't. Well, I agree with the first part of what you said, and I think Ethereum already has a moat. Um, and I think that token design can really create moats as well if you're intelligent about the way that you incentivize and reward people for building on your platform because we're humans. We respond to incentives, it's, you know, rational and in, in our nature. So um but I don't agree necessarily with the second part of your statement where you said that the applications at the top can't accrue value. I think the applications at the top are the user facing piece of this technology stack and users can be very sticky as we saw with, you know, even the crappiest of social networks, right? So when there's a network effect there where once you get enough people using something- Do you something, think there's anything that's built that network effect and kind of built that moat from an application perspective yet? Um, yes, I do. Like, I think that um, I, I don't know whether you would call this, it, it's not like a crypto protocol, but just the idea of NFTs and certain projects and the, you know, excitement around some of those projects is is indeed a moat. And um, I, I don't know if you have like a mass. And is, is the moat, is the moat there, the basically 
the brand that they've built and the users and the community? Is that what you would define as the moat in the case of those? Like, are you talking about like Board Ape Yacht Club and specific projects like that or? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, those projects, they have a wallet address, they are on chain things and they have a moat because of the way they make their users feel right. The way they, the way they make their, their community feel, um, as owners of what they produce. And, you know, I guess there's no smash hit crypto application in the web two sense with billions and billions of users that, you know, the society can't live without yet, but there are already little things popping up in crypto, just proving that people, people can get very attached and emotional and, and, and care deeply about something. So I think this is just the beginning of the application layer. And, and so, so the multi-billion dollar question then is what does become those first applications of crypto that, that attract hundreds of millions of users? Like where, where like, you know, obviously it's a very difficult question, right? Which is, yes. which is why there are hundreds of VCs competing to, to fund these projects. But where do you think like the first types of things are that, you know, I would argue like, you know, I talk about this a lot on the podcast. I think stable coins are one of the best use cases. Um, you know, clearly what happened with circle and freezing assets in tornado cash, maybe, makes that a little bit more difficult combined with everything that's gone on with algorithmic stable coins, but for all intents and purposes, like stable coins for remittances is something that I, I see as a, as a real use case. I'm wondering what you see being, being kind of, you know, things that attract hundreds of millions of users. Oh, um, I mean, I guess my answers are kind of banal, but I think that DeFi NFTs, social and gaming are going to be massive smash hits on on chain and the reason why i think so is well let's just start with DeFi, for example by the time you and i are you know old geezers i would imagine that most people under the age of 30 their very first bank account was a wallet you know some crypto wallet right and if that's your native experience for your financial life, like at what, at what point do you even need TradFi, especially since TradFi doesn't pay you? What, what do you, what do you imagine the wallets denominate? Like what is the base currency that they're denominating in? Do you think it's a stable coin still, or do you think it's like a digital asset that doesn't exist yet? Do you think it's Bitcoin? Do you think it's ETH? I think we're at the, in the first stages of the fragmentation of global commerce into different types of global reserve currencies. And much like the world doesn't need 250 tokens as their, you know, primary unit of... Well, the great value. thing is there's a lot more than 250 tokens. There's like exactly. 5,000 of them. <laughs> but where I was going with this, much like the, you know, most of the top 250 tokens aren't money, but the top 10 probably are indeed money. You don't need 250 fiat currencies either, right? You have the dollar, the euro, the yen maybe a couple of others that are locally relevant um, in certain like trade networks. And you learn this as a commodities trader, but like I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, in the scenario where we're talking about, like you have Bitcoin, you have ETH. Uh, I love near. I think that one's really interesting and for a variety of reasons, but I think you have a couple other tokens that in addition to the dollar and possibly the Euro, um, you know, in 50 years that people are transacting and consider their, their so store of value. You know, if you're living, if you're living in a developing country, especially a developing country that the United States of America doesn't like, you know, how do you store wealth? Like, do you, do you keep it under your mattress and what do you keep under your mattress? Like maybe a ledger nano, you know? And so, you know, speaking about, uh, you know, we spoke a little bit about, um, you know, kind of what you're excited about and, and, you know, kind of value accrual and, and building moats. But, you know, what do you think are the key drivers or determinants of price movement in this space? And obviously that's incredibly important for you, given the amount of risk that you guys take as a liquidity provider. Like, what do you guys, what types of, and I'm not asking for any secret sauce, but what types of factors uh, do you think are, are, are real determinants and drivers of this market? Oh, we'll, we'll give your listeners the sauce, Josh. Um, <laughs> Basically, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of time sciencing this. Like we, we have, it's our job. And determinants of price can be anything from, well, flows are the most obvious answer. Big flows move markets. Um, the availability of credit or lack thereof is a big determinant. Um, 
the underlying fundamentals. This is something that a lot of traders just ignore entirely. Uh, you know, it's because studying the fundamentals of something are hard, right? Getting deep into the weeds of crypto, like like you do, um, which I, I respect you tremendously for. Like, you need to do that, right? You need to really understand what's going on underneath the hood, and because it moves prices a lot in certain cases, especially in some of the you know the riskier tokens. Um, but also, there are certain kind of like technical things that that move prices, and you sort of have to analyze them constantly at an atomic level. As if if you're going to call yourself you know an elite trading company. Um, you have to be scanning the, scanning every market, collecting every tick, every, every bid and offer in the stack, storing it, analyzing it in real time, applying processing, systematically digesting that information and translating it into, you know, proprietary and counterparty facing trading activity in order to maintain your edge. And, you know, that's probably the, the sauce that we probably, you know, shouldn't share, but it's, the features that go into those models, the number of equations that go into the, sorry, the number of variables that go into the equation whose output is the price of Bitcoin is vast. And we try to learn and understand as many of those variables and coefficients as we can. Yeah. And, and obviously those variables are constantly and ever changing and ever evolving, right? And it's, it's, it's how you combine the, the data, which is, is the secret sauce, right? It's not, you know, it's not one thing in particular. It's obviously a combination of things that, that have an impact. But I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, the, the quality of market data in this space from exchanges, the quality of APIs, what the exchanges are actually providing, it varies very significantly across venues. And so I'm curious what challenges that presents. I mean, I'm thankful that, you know, Aaron Bedra, our head of engineering, is the best software developer I've ever worked with. Like, the guy is a superstar. And you need to be in order to manage that. Right. That is a crazy one. You know, I think Sam Bankman Freed, when he was, a, you know, running a trading shop, realized the inefficiencies of a lot of those APIs. And, and you know, a lot of them are just white labeled garbage. Right. And he went and built FTX because he saw firsthand the inefficiencies of of connecting to many of these very relevant liquidity venues and, you know, had to decided to just make a better mousetrap to catch more mice. You know, like we. It's a bit of a vague answer to your question, Josh, but like we were, some of them are terrible. Like you, they'll literally just like rug your, your access or change the back end of their code. And then, <clears throat> you know, it's like the, the beating heart of the patient just starts to flatline and we're sitting like on the desk, like what just happened, you know, and you have to then go w without, without. It, like without imposing any downtime on your liquidity engine that you provide to the whole world, to our OTC counterparties, to exchanges, we have to go and diagnose that in real time and, and reconnect wires and like go, it's, it's, it's a savage job. It's not easy. Yeah. And I, I wonder like over time, if exchanges move to build better market data, but actually charge for it, which is just the more traditional model, Coinbase actually the other day announced it didn't get much publicity, but that that skew is being stopped as a service. It's being brought into that data is being brought into Coinbase Prime Analytics or whatever. But what a lot of people miss is that they actually announced a data hub or something as part of that. And if you go there, it says contact sales and it's all their market data. So I wonder if Coinbase will be the first to kind of go that route down that router. I don't know if you have any thoughts about paid well, market the exchanges. There are other data providers that provide very, very detailed, granular data. Um, Coinbase no, I mean, sorry, but by that, I mean the exchange themselves charging for the market data in crypto is a novel idea. It do doesn't exist yet. Interesting. Um, well, it, it definitely exists in TradFi. No, that's talking. my point. That's my point yeah. is I wonder if the exchanges will offer a better service and charge for it as opposed to just letting anybody hit their API a billion times. Interesting. Um, well, yeah, so hitting the API a billion times, it, it's funny, you say that, but you can't do it, right? Like throughput is a variable in the equation that, that you, you know, need to think through to connect to exchanges and trade. So do you want to like clog up your pipeline of throughput with API requests to collect data or do you want to use that pipeline to trade? And ultimately, there's a balance and working out that ratio of trade to data is like something we actually have to optimize um, as, as a you know, liquidity provider for every venue. But in terms of, you know, 
if crypto turns out like TradFi turned out, which I don't think will happen in this case because it's a techno technology native asset class. But if it if, if it goes the way of TradFi, the data sold by exchanges is garbage. Like they, the ice. It, you know, if you're a monopoly, if you're you know Time Warner Cable, you can provide a, a bad service and expect to get revenue no matter yeah, what. Yeah, Time Warner yeah. Cable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I know you know that one. We we both lived in New York. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's bad. But I think crypto is going to have more competition, and the, the you know Coinbase will probably offer a much better product in crypto than the ICE offered in crude oil. So one of the things that you mentioned when speaking about price movement is is fundamentals. And you know you said people need to understand fundamentals. Well, the great thing is you're on the Fundamental Value podcast. And so one question that we ask all of our guests is, what are fundamentals in crypto? What does that even mean? So. It's a, it's a fantastic question. And let me just start by addressing, you know, the many people who've told me crypto has no fundamentals, right? right. That's just wrong. The, the, the difference between crypto's fundamentals and the fundamentals of, again, I'm just going to bring up crude oil because it's my experience. Like crude oil's fundamentals are very well defined and the tails of the distribution are fairly thin because, you know, so many people are aware of you know, the market's been around for 130 years. Uh, people understand it so well that as you as you price in outcomes, you know, back and forth across the distribution, the, the tails aren't that thick. So basically it results in less price volatility. Whereas in crypto, you know, we oscillate back and forth between as a marketplace, between thinking that this is this is the future of everything, this is the future of money, this is the future of finance, art, music, like everything, and this is all this is all going to disappear, right? That's what the market oscillates between those two very fat tails. And if you, and so that obviously results in a tremendous amount of price volatility that you don't see in later stage um, as fundamentally driven assets like commodities. However, the fundamentals are real. And what are they to, to answer your question? The fundamentals are what value is being delivered via these, you know, digital goods and services to the end user and what is their demand for that? And, and you know, what is the supply of these goods and services? Like, what does what the supply picture look like? And while there is an infinite supply of digital coins, uh, practically, there's, there's a very finite supply of useful ones. And um, that, like, if you analyze it, the, the word, I hate the word tokenomics, but it's probably the only relevant word here. Like, if you if you dig through the white paper and you look at the use cases and who's using them and, and what the supply of those products and services looks like, suddenly it doesn't look any, any different from analyzing a company, a corporate bond, agricultural commodity, crude, anything, you know? And so one of the interesting points that you made, um, you know, you spoke about earlier the fact that 10 of the 250 cryptocurrencies probably are currencies. Uh, or Kirk will be used as such in the future. But one of the questions I had lined up for you, which I actually asked on one of my last episodes that I really liked is, looking two years in the future, take the top 100 coins that exist today, how many of them are still going to be there? And why will certain ones be there and others not there? Ooh, that's a difficult one. Um, let's go with, out of the top 100 in two years, 25 will still be around in the top 100 of that time. Let's say three quarter cull, twenty five percent. You want to be long those twenty five coins, in my opinion. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? It's what's the hey, why? Why will certain coins be there and, and others not? And do you think, by the way, it's the top twenty five that exists today that are still going to be there, or are there coins that are eighty seven and ninety two and fifty six that are going to be there? The latter. I think that some of the top twenty five, particularly Bitcoin, ETH, and again, I, I love Near. I think they'll I think they'll be in the top 25 in the future, but I think you're going to see some big jumps from the lower tiers and, you know, it, you know, maybe things that don't even exist yet up into the top 25. And I think what will drive that is, you know, well, it, the, the answer to your question is different depending on what layer of the stack we're talking about. For layer ones, there's going to be a, you know, a network effect, an entrenched sort of player effect, um, but there's also going to be an innovation effect, right? Like, how do you how do you attract users away from Ethereum or Solana or whatever? Um, you have to offer some extraordinarily useful um, feature, and you know 
let's say that that feature is instead of like, hey, in order to get paid to build an application on our layer one, uh, you have to design some some coin, some token. You don't, you're not a coin designer. You're not an economist, but that's the only way you get paid. You have to make your own token to get paid. Like rather than that, maybe some layer ones will say, okay, so if if your application results in a in a smart contract transaction on our network, we will pay you in the native token. We'll reward you in the native token of our layer one. Like that's what Near does. That's genius. That's how you know. That's how America works. That you every you know. Your barber doesn't charge you barber coin. Um, Your barber charges you dollars. And so, you know, features like that will sort of drive adoption. And who who knows what's going to come. I'm super, I'm super excited about Ave's new lens product. I think there's a lot of, a lot of like very value accretive to the user type ideas in that particular social network. And, you know, hey, if that catches on or if it becomes composable into something that catches on, like, you know, it could that that could be something that drives uh, you know the ascent of a token into the top 25 of you know 2 years from now so two two questions the first is i want to i want to let you get out why near because it sounds like you're itching to tell the listeners about near so so why is near so exciting what 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 makes it so unique that that thing that i just said about how they reward um the, the way they reward software developers so you you don't you don't have to make a shit coin to get paid on that network. You just make software and you get paid in near. That's it. Like it, you know, often here at Cumberland when we're solving super complicated problems, we'll sit, have three whiteboards next to each other, draw trillions of lines and boxes and just have this lattice of like what the problem looks like. And then we can't figure out what's going on. And then we look at it for a while and then we like, cross out one line and like move it from what it was going from box one to box two. And we just like say, Hey, instead of that, let's go from box one to box three. And then suddenly the whole system just prints cash. Like it's sometimes it's a small fix. Right. And that's what cryptos, that's what's so beautiful about crypto. You just fork something that exists, make one small fix. And then suddenly it's brilliant. Right. And near kind of did that. So that's why I'm so excited about it. And so, you know, we, we spoke a lot about, Cumberland's involvement in, with DeFi and trading on chain. Do you think there's any merit to permissioned DeFi? Like, does anybody care? Is anybody going to use it? Or oh yes, and I'm very glad you asked because we are giant permissioned DeFi bulls. And like, what's going to take DeFi into the killer app mode? It's it's already a killer app, right? You, you know, it's it's banking the unbanked already. And that's a killer app. It's facilitating value storage and transfer in ways that you know no one's ever understood before. But the killer app <clears throat> for all of this stuff is when you can basically when you can offer sort of like a new value layer to people that they never had before. And I think in terms of like what what's going to take DeFi to the next level is permissioning because not everybody wants everyone else to see all of their transactions, especially banks and commodities players. Like, and so if you can just hide a couple of things um, on chain so that the whole world can't see them, that's enough. That's like the redrawing of the one line that suddenly brings in billions and billions of dollars worth of activity because that is a real value add to users. And I saw this firsthand when I worked at VTOL, right? Like, the, some of the people involved in getting <laughs> raw commodities from here to there, they don't want you to know what they're doing. But also, they don't want to overpay. They don't want to pay 30% of every dollar uh, to credibly neutral intermediaries like VTOL to f- facilitate that and hide what they're, you know, h- just basically conceal what they're doing, but also not like betray them in any way and not have to face their adversarial counterparty. They face a credibly neutral intermediary. DeFi can be that credibly neutral intermediary for a very small price. And the only the only missing piece right now in, in a you know big way is permissioning. So there's some really interesting chains, some of which we've invested in that are building that and we think it's going to be huge. And so, you know, you talked about DeFi being the killer app. I just like the market cap of all of DeFi is about $51 billion. Um, the, the market cap of all of crypto is about 1.1 trillion. So it's still fractionally small. I mean, it, it, and, and, and relatively small. I mean, if you took, you know, FTX's last round plus Coinbase's valuation, that's about all of DeFi. 
uh, in aggregate, you know, obviously questions as to whether or not those companies are, are worth what they may have raised at. Obviously, Coinbase is public. You know, I'm speaking to FTX, but you know, what does 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 DeFi being a killer app necessarily equate to the market cap of DeFi being m- giant, or can DeFi being a killer app and that just accrues the majority of the value to the layer ones that those those killer apps are built on top of? I don't know. And I should know. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I think it's important to be honest. Um, I mean, by the way, I'm, I don't know either, which is why I have this podcast. so I can ask really <laughs> smart people like you so I can form an opinion that I still don't have today. So um, I think that I think DeFi will be enormous in a market cap sense. Um, if it's not like 50 billion is enormous already, if you think about it. Um, it's just it's only 5% is the is the like, as it from a percentage it has perspective, has to be a right? lot bigger. I mean, okay. So how about this? If you consider Bitcoin DeFi, which I would say it is, right? It's a decentralized currency, which is what's more financial than a currency. Then what's the market cap of DeFi, right? Um, well, then it would be five percent plus probably thirty percent or whatever the Bitcoin dominance is. There you go. 35. Yeah. So if we're thinking through this, uh, and then if you think about how much ETH is being used as money. Um, to buy digital goods and services, maybe you're closer to 50%. I don't know. But um, let's just say it's 5%. Yeah, it should probably be way bigger than that. Uh, I think that, again, it just boils down to um, the shitty word tokenomics. Like if you, if, if you're- is, a is, it, is it because the tokenomics of DeFi projects are just shitty? Is that part of it? Some of them right now are just a sieve. Like, you know, I don't know whether that's good or bad, whether that means value is getting accrued to users or whether um, the uh, whether the value is just being lost somehow. Uh, I think it depends on a token to token basis. But eventually somebody's going to reward users with a coin that you know appreciates as the value of the network expands. And you know, at, when that occurs, whether it's a permissioned um ecosystem or not like yeah i think the value of DeFi as a percentage of total crypto is not going to be five percent anymore i think it's going to become a lot bigger and crypto will become a lot bigger too so let's let's finish off with a couple really quick fire questions uh number one what has surprised you most about crypto markets um the volatility you you can watch it but until you start trading it nothing nothing prepares you for this it's crazy what in crypto has you most excited right now um the prospect of tokenization of real world commodities. I'm a, I'm a commodities geek. I love them. I'm fascinated by them. I read history books about them. And the more you spend time in commodities, the more you realize that blockchains solve most of the intermediation problems that every, that human society, um, experiences when they move. So, so what comes for because my, my question around securitization, it's always been a chicken and the egg problem to me, right? Like you're never going to have good assets tokenized unless you have the liquidity and you're never going to have the liquidity unless the good assets get to- tokenized. So what is going to come first? I think uh, somebody's going to tokenize an asset, a real world asset and liquidity is just going to explode. And I think it has to be a fungible one, like a commodity. Like I, you know, I'm, I hear a lot about like NFT mortgages and stuff, and that's, that's definitely on the roadmap and it's cool. But I think before that happens, you have to have a liquid fungible thing get tokenized. And we're already seeing it with FX. Um, the next thing is commodities. Um, and frankly, like once you trade commodities, you realize just how, how illiquid they truly are. Like it would shock 99.8% of the world's crude oil isn't tradable. Right, like WTI and Brent are twenty basis points of of actual physical consumption, but like ninety nine percent of prices are set off of those two grades that represent such a tiny niche. And like at some point, somebody's going to say, "I'm going to tokenize, you know, Bonnie Light from Nigeria, crude oil that's just a massive fire hose of oil." And maybe the people in Nigeria who sell it, and the people around the world, all over the world who buy it, are going to prefer that as a proxy for their risk. And then you get speculators, and then it just takes off. I don't, I don't know, but. Real world commodities trading um, in tokenized format, it's just better. And it, I think it will happen. I'm most excited about that. And final question, what is your most controversial crypto view? My most controversial view? I think, I think Lens is the next big social network. How about that? Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate your time. This was awesome. I learned a ton. So thank you for coming on. Final thing is, where can people find you uh, and learn more about Cumberland? 
Well, you can you can find us at Cumberland Says on Twitter. Um, just you know, we post trading commentaries from time to time. Join the conversation. Like we we're not going to figure this out by ourselves. It's a new market. We we love talking to people. Reach out, hit us up, and um, you know, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I, I learned a ton too. Like you're you 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 got your your ducks in a row. This is awesome. All right, thanks a lot, Jonah. Thank you.